This show is sponsored by Headnote, helping law firms get paid 70% faster with their compliant e-payments and accounts receivables automation platform. Learn how to get paid quicker and more efficiently at headnote.com. Welcome to the Modern Law Library. I'm your host, the ABA Journal's Lee Rawls, and today I'm speaking with Steph Cha, author of the novel, Your House Will Pay. Steph, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. So it's been a while since we've had a novel on the show, and I wanted to bring you in to talk about your book. Could you please give us a brief description of how you came to write it and broadly what it's what the setting is? So this book is loosely based on a real killing that happened in 1991 in Los Angeles that was a major flashpoint for existing tensions between Blacks and Koreans in Los Angeles. There was this situation where Korean immigrants ran a large percentage of the businesses in South Central LA and served a mostly black population. And there were a lot of, there was a lot of resentment between those communities. You know, the Koreans kind of, none of them lived there. And there was suspicion of the locals. They often didn't hire them. There were kind of cultural miscues. And it all culminated in this shooting of a young black teenager by a Korean liquor store owner who was then convicted of voluntary manslaughter, but sentenced to no jail time. And this was seen as one of the secondary causes of the LA uprising or LA riots in response to the, um, the 1992 decision to acquit the police officers who beat Rodney King. And it's also credited with causing the disproportionate amount of damage to Korean businesses in the ensuing rioting. So can you tell us a little bit about your background? Are you from Los Angeles? I am. I grew up in LA, but I'll add the caveat that I was born in 1986. So I was a child when all of this was happening. And I also grew up in the San Fernando Valley, which was very suburban. And I had no awareness of any of this going on at the time. So I grew up in L.A. and I kind of grew up understanding some of this history in a vague way. But a lot of it was stuff that I discovered as an adult, you know, or that I really got into thinking about in a particularly um, focused way, I guess. So it's interesting to hear you say that because as I was reading the book, um, I was actually 11, 10 and 11 when this was happening. And I was growing up in central Illinois. So I was far away from Los Angeles And some of my memories were very, very vague. I remembered, of course, you know, the the Rodney King meeting. But I had no idea that 63 people died in this time period. And that was that was pretty shocking to me. You open up the novel by introducing one of the two main characters. Could you talk about the two main characters and how you came to choose those two viewpoints to go forward with and your house will pay? Yeah. So Sean, who's the first protagonist that we meet, he is the younger brother of basically my stand-in for Latasha Harlins, who was the victim in that 1991 shooting. So Sean is now an adult man in his early 40s who um, has lost his sister in this very public and tragic way almost 30 years ago. And he has kind of put his life together in a pretty stable way after having it derail largely because of what happened to his family. And then the other protagonist is Grace, who is a young Korean American woman. She's, she's 27 years old and she finds out in present day that her mother was the shooter in this case. And so these two families are connected by this tragic, terrible crime and history, and are forced to reckon with each other in present day. One of the contrasts between the two that I found so striking was that Sean really had his childhood ripped away from him by a whole series of events. And Grace seems like she's in almost an enforced childlike state. She Mm -hmm. is 27 or 28. She has graduated from pharmacy school, but she still lives at home in contrast to her sister who left the family so completely that there's a bit of an estrangement there. 
When you were writing, were you thinking much about that, about contrasting those experiences and then how do these two people ever relate? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the main thing about Grace is she's incredibly sheltered in a way that I see in plenty of people in that age group. I think especially like Korean American kids. I think this is true of a lot of immigrant groups, not just Koreans, but like Korean American kids who are unmarried and who who live near their parents um, often end up moving in with their parents, at least in LA. I mean, I moved in with my parents after law school for a year when I was kind of figuring some stuff out. And it's it's more accepted and normal than like non-immigrant, fa- than in non-immigrant families, I feel like. And it just kind of goes hand in hand with this sheltered mindset that you can maintain if nothing has really touched you directly. And so I wanted to contrast that state of being with Sean's, which is, you know, he might not necessarily want to engage in the muck of politics or anything like that either. But for him, it's not that he's sheltered, it's that he's been overexposed, and that he's exhausted by it. So that's kind of the main contrast between those two characters. I mean, there are others, but that's a thematic one. Now, you mentioned getting involved in politics, and there are kind of for me, reading this, two characters who really embody that on, in sort of both families. One is Aunt Sheila, Sean's aunt, and the other one is Miriam, who is Grace's older sister. You based Aunt Sheila off a real human being, too, correct? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Aunt Sheila is actually the only character in this book who is based pretty explicitly on a real person, as in I borrowed some characteristics from this person and I consciously paid homage to her. Um, She's based on Denise Harlins, I mean, loosely based on her, who was the aunt of Latasha Harlins. She passed away at the end of 2018. But she's somebody who became an activist after her niece was murdered. And she spent a lot of her life keeping not only her niece's name alive, but also doing advocacy for other child victims And, you know, she became kind of this visible activist figure in Los Angeles, in L.A. politics. And I I just always found her pretty admirable and just so, like, hardworking in this crusade to keep this memory alive when people are so willing to forget your loved ones. So she is somebody who, um, you know, when I brought her into this story, helped me really figure out a lot of things about how it was going to work. You know, particularly, you know, she kind of clashes with Sean, and I have sympathy for both of them. But yeah, so she was based on Denise Harlins. Did you ever have an opportunity to meet Denise? No, and I fully intended to meet her. She died young. I think she was in her 50s, maybe her early 60s. I had seen her speak once at the California African American Museum, a a kind of large panel event. And I just, I didn't want to like go up and introduce myself, but you know, I had found her Facebook and I was like trying to contact her. I was trying to look for an email address and then, and then she passed away, but I always wanted to meet her. Mm -hmm. And she, to me, kind of represents an earlier generation and the way the earlier generation attempted to advocate and protest. And to me, Miriam is this next generation. Now she's you know in her 30s, so she's not like one of the very courageous teenagers we see being advocates mm-hmm. today. But really, it, it is a little bit of a different world. And you describe some of those protests. Could you talk a little bit about Miriam and, and how you came to form her character? You know, Miriam has a lot of me in her, and which is why sometimes I make a lot of fun of her other than, (laughs) you know, also the fact that she's, she's all, she's mostly described from her sister's point of view and her sister kind of rolls her eyes at her. But I mean, Miriam is somebody who is politically very conscious and I think her heart is in the, the right place a lot of time, but she's somebody who's largely unaffected by a lot of, a lot of the issues that she, um, that she cares about. She is a writer who lives in Silver Lake. She she lives with a wealthy boyfriend who's white. And so she, she kind of represents this sort of low stakes activism, I guess I would put it, where she I, I, she does 
kind of what she feels like she can do. And I think so many people who are kind of active on social media and who pay attention to the disaster of current events end up in this position. And I have a lot of sympathy for it. I also find it a little bit of a ridiculous privileged position, you know, when you're living on the coast and a lot of these things don't affect you. But like, it's one that I understand. And so she's kind of in that, in that group, because, you know, she has had her, her relationship, even to the events that her family is directly involved in. It's not the same as Aunt Sheila's or Sean's. And she's conscious of that. And there's nothing she can do about it. You know, it's just sometimes when you are somebody who cares about things very deeply without kind of the, uh, but you, but you engage from a position of privilege, there's just something a little bit ridiculous about that. And that's fine. And I think that's kind of where Miriam is at. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned before that you have been to law school and, you know, I have many lawyers who listen to my podcast and many lawyers, you know, I would say a real commonality that I see is that lawyers love words and mm -hmm. lawyers, when they have time, love reading. Yeah. Um, and I think that many of my listeners probably think, you know what, I have a novel in me somewhere. And this, just to be clear, this is not your first novel. You have a whole series um, with Juniper Song. But can you talk a little bit about your path from law school to eventually being a writer and, and how that went? So I went to law school straight out of college. I was an English major. It's a pretty typical story, really. It's uh, I didn't know what you could do <laughs> like for a job or, you know, I, I was kind of, I, I don't know. I feel like my whole life I knew how to do more school. And mm -hmm. so I went to college and I took another standardized test and I got into more schools and I thought, all right, I'll do this next. And I think I probably should have spent more time out in the world and like gotten to know myself a little bit better before making that decision. I mean, I don't regret it at all, but I, I, I was definitely one of those risk averse English majors who just ended up going to law school because I got in. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when I started law school, you know, I continued to read constantly and that's something that I always wanted, uh, that, that I was always interested in. You know, and even now, I'm probably more of a reader than I am a writer by time and interest. I mean, I, if I could just read books and make a living doing that, I would, I would absolutely do that and write a novel every 10 years or so. But so I kept reading fiction, but I, I didn't know anybody who wrote fiction as work or, or even, even as a hobby. And so I didn't have examples of people who were working writers. I think maybe if I did, I would have thought of that as more of a possibility. But I knew lots of lawyers. My dad and my uncles are lawyers. And so that felt like, you know, something that real people did. But I kept I kept up with my interest in reading, you know, even as even while we were in first year law school, you know, I was always reading a novel. And after my 1L year, I summered at a law firm that I just hated. I mean, it was just the culture of that law firm was like heinous for, for women and people there seemed miserable. And I just had this inkling of, well, I, this is not a place I want to work. This is not the kind of place I want to work. Maybe I should give writing a go. Something about going to school is that you have flexibility in what you do with your schedule. I'm actually a lot more impressed with people who like, have full-time jobs and find time to write. I think that would have been harder for me actually having had full-time jobs where I've had to squeeze in my writing time. But I started writing as, when I was a student and I would just find time, you know, when I probably should have been studying. I wasn't the best law student, to be honest. I mean, <laughs> I skipped a lot of class and I was not like, I, I did not have like an exceptional transcript, but I wrote a book. So by the time I graduated from law school, I had the uh, manuscript for Follow Our Home, which was my first novel. I met my agent like right before I graduated. So I kind of went along that path, you know, with the idea that I wanted to publish and I wanted to pursue this in a serious way. And then I ended up doing temp work as a lawyer for like five years after law school. I did Japanese language document review, 
which Oof. is this like very easy but well paying niche doc review because there just aren't a lot of bard attorneys who also are fluent in Japanese. I happen to be fluent in Japanese. So I did that for like half the year and wrote for the other half of the year. And that actually worked out pretty well for a while. Well, we're going to take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsor. And when we return, we're going to hear more from Steph Cha, author of Your House Will Pay. Hey, law firms. Getting paid is fantastic, but dealing with accounts receivable is such a pain. What if there was a better way? In her head note, an industry-leading compliant e-payments and AR automation system. Their unique blend of features cuts through the noise and helps you to get paid 70% faster. Skip the paper checks, spreadsheets, and awkward calls to overdue clients. Get paid faster with less effort. Visit headnote.com for more information. Welcome back to the Modern Law Library. I'm your host, Lee Rawls, and I'm still speaking with Steph Cha, author of Your House Will Pay. And I want to dive into the title. It's very epic, kind of Shakespearean. Could you talk about how you arrived at this title? Yeah, the title, I'm, I'm very happy with this title. I will say I'm not happy with all of my titles, but this one, I felt like I got it right. I knew early on that I would love to have a title that was from like an early 90s LA hip hop song because that just that's kind of the era that I was writing from. The working title for a long time was Black Korea. Ice Cube has like a very short song called Black Korea that wasn't perfect for you know it wasn't a perfect title but like that's kind of the mood that I had in mind. Um, this very confrontational song and I was told by my editor agent, like, you can't really call it Black Korea. And it wasn't really perfectly apt anyway. But so then I went on this ter- search for a new title. And I wanted it to, you know, ideally be an Ice Cube lyric. I could not find one that worked. And I also wanted, if possible, to kind of get that tragic Shakespearean, or at least, or maybe, maybe biblical element into it. And I found this song called Batteram by an artist named Toddy T, who was active mostly in the 80s in L.A. But this was a song about police, uh, armored police vehicles that would ram into suspected crack houses. And there was a lyric in there that went, hang it up, homeboy, your house will pay. And when I got to that, I thought, oh, this is perfect. This is a song that deals with you know, the relationship between police and the community. There's crime in it. There is this sense of revenge. Even the fact that, like, house in the title it gave it this kind of Greek feel. Oh, sure. I thought about, you know, a plague on both your houses. Yeah. 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 So I landed on that and that stuck. But, you know, I, I came up with that probably three, three and a half years into this process. You know, I've been writing it with a different title for a long time. And now I'd love to hear a sample from the book. Um, is there a passage that you could read to us that is it's not going to spoil too much, <laughs> but really gives a, a flavor of the book? Yeah. So I'm going to read a little bit from part of the book where Sean is kind of called to action by his his cousin's wife. He's been helping his cousin's family out while his cousin served 10 years in federal prison. And so he has become this surrogate father figure to them. And and one of the kids is a 16-year-old boy named Daryl who gets into a stupid accident. And Sean goes to kind of bail him out. You know, he's he's an unlicensed driver, and um, Sean kind of lays into him at a Burger King. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. But you gotta understand, I'm furious with you. You're a child, ditching school, going on joy rides, but you're plenty old enough to wreck your life and bring your whole family down with you. This is when shit gets permanent. The choices you make are gonna stick. They're gonna follow you. He listened to his own voice, and it sounded strange to him, heavy and reproachful and slightly false, like he'd rehearsed this speech in front of a mirror. The despair settled into his gut. He'd said all of this before, when Daryl got caught cutting school. 
That was supposed to be a man-to-man, come-to-Jesus kind of talk, not something trotted out every few months because it changed nothing. Do you want to end up like your dad? He asked, desperation rising to his throat. He could tell from the stunned look on his nephew's face that he'd tripped right over the line. He didn't mean for it to come out that way. Why not, Daryl said with sudden force. He's my dad. I can't be like him. Who am I supposed to be like then? You? Sean heard the contempt in his nephew's voice and knew it was something he'd held hidden that now he could never take back. It hurt, as Daryl had meant it to hurt, and Sean had to push it down deep to keep his calm. I didn't mean it like that, he said. He looked at Daryl with all the fear and love he had for him. There was so much he almost shook with it. I don't want you to be like me either. I want your life to be better than both of ours. The boy put his face in his hands and cried. For all his swagger, his pose of hardened dignity, he was still a child. Sean reached across the table, lightheaded with relief, and set both arms on Daryl's quaking shoulders. Oh, thank you for reading that. And when we meet Sean, he's even younger than Daryl. And I thought that the scene that starts out the book is, it, it really sweeps you up, much like the crowd is swept up. And I was wondering how you did your research into what it felt like to be part of a crowd that turns into a mob. I think most people have probably been at a party that turned bad, and you, you feel something in the air. Mm-hmm signaling, oh, something's about to turn, and then it turns. But when you're dealing with a real event, like the L.A. riots, were you able to talk to people who were involved in it? How did you research that, and how did you dis- come to describe the experience of being swept up in in a riot? I did a lot of research on the 92 riots, the actual six days of rioting in April and May, A lot of that was watching video and reading news coverage and talking to people who kind of lived through that time period and getting the, I don't know, just listening to the way they describe like the mood. But, you know, I knew that because a lot of this book was going to be emanating from the LA uprising, that I wanted it to have this feeling of being kind of bookended by frenzy. And a friend of mine who knew that I was working on this book in like very early stages, he offered to talk to me when I was doing research for it because he went to Latasha Harmless's high school. And he, he grew up in L.A. in that t- same time period. And he's, you know, he's now a black man, probably around Sean's age. And he actually participated in that, like, small Westwood riot that opens the book. And if it weren't for that, I don't think I would have heard about that event. It's like a... You know, once he told me that he he went to this New Jack City premiere and it ended up in this in this three hour riot in Westwood, I was able to Google it and find like the one L.A. Times article about it and study the hell out of that. And I just picked his brain about like everything about that day and also, you know, the events afterwards. And so that was a major get for me that like I actually have a friend who had like this direct experience and was willing to share it with me and also read it on the back end but yeah that was that that was a real thing that happened you know and and I wanted to write that scene too because you know I did want to show Sean as a child because so much of this book is him being this wary old man and I mean when I say old man he's middle-aged but like he has this like old man feel to him and you know, he is somebody whose childhood was cut short. And I wanted to capture um, the exuberance of that early bit of rioting. You know, it wasn't it was not the same as what came later. And I wanted to capture that. And I also just did like, I've read a lot of books that have kind of these crowd scenes. And I was thinking about those as I wrote, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a hard thing to block out. But a lot of that is just kind of craft work. Mm-hmm. Now to turn to Grace and her life and, and her community. Another really interesting thing to me was the aspect of her church and the church that her family belongs to. There's one really powerful scene 
where she looks around and she realizes she knows, you know, negative gossip, negative things about so many of these people. And yet in this community, they can they can still be part of the community and they can still be accepted in some ways. Could you kind of describe how you formed the church life that Grace and her family had and representing that aspect that it's not that we don't know that you're a sinner. We know these things, um, but you're still you're still one of ours and you can still come and be part of this. Yeah, you know, when I was um, researching the Latasha Harlan's Sunjadu case, you know, one of the things that stood out to me was that Sunjadu's church really turned up for her. Like, the, I think they helped get the defense fund together. They showed up at court. And, you know, I have mixed feelings about this because I think that, you know, she, she, she was a murderer and she got away with the murder pretty much. And this was an end in the church, and uh, which is really a stand-in for her community, like, helped her do it, you know? And there's a positive side to it that, like, in the sense that, like, yeah, I guess there's something about, like, being part of a community that accepts you for who you are and what you've done, you know, that can be a beautiful thing if you're the person who is benefiting from it. It can also be a thing that lets you off the hook. And so I wanted to present it in that way where, you know, you see this happening and like, you don't really know if she deserves it or if she's being enabled. And if this community has allowed her to kind of deny her own culpability or if it's like a beautiful thing where there's acceptance and it is actually a very Christian thing to, to separate the sin and the sinner. And, and I kind of wanted to leave it that way where like, I'm not really declaring that like it should be this way or that way, but like that is the reality of um, being part of a community. It's part of being part of a family too, that you take people as they come because you have to, you don't really have a choice. And the other thing about churches, I, I grew up in Korean church. My, um, grandfather is a retired minister and I went to the church that they go to in the book. And it also felt like a point of commonality between the black and Korean communities. I mean, those are both church going communities in Los Angeles and elsewhere in the States. And, you know, it touched on so many things, so many of the things that I wanted to explore these just ideas of um, good and evil and whether forgiveness is possible, whether redemption is possible and so all these things kind of came together in this very natural backdrop because, you know, every Korean my age almost grew up going to church at some point or another. And it wasn't necessarily even an intensely religious thing so much as a social thing. You know, the Korean church became this center of social activity for, you know, clusters of Korean immigrants. Um, and that's kind of how I met other Korean kids. And it was a structure that that allowed for the community to mingle. Well, I want to close out by asking you to talk a little bit about your Juniper Song series. Now, just full disclosure to you and to my listeners, I, I have not yet read it. I As soon as I finished uh, Your House Will Pay, I w- went out and I bought uh, Follow You, Follow Her Home. Um, so I will be reading it. <laughs> Thank but you. could you talk a little bit about your your first series in case my read- my listeners read this book and then want more? Yeah. So um, my first three books are all part of the same series. And I would say Your House Will Pay is kind of loosely crime fiction and that it is driven by crime. But it's more of it's more of like a character driven, like social novel. But my first three books are explicitly crime novels. They're they're mysteries with a PI protagonist. In the first book, she's an amateur private investigator. By the third book, she is, um, you know, working in an official capacity. And they're in the Raymond Chandler vein of L.A. noir. You know, I wanted to write a book that challenged Raymond Chandler's vision of Los Angeles. You know, he's one of my favorite authors, and he's really the definitive author of Los Angeles as far as mood goes, you know, even today. But, you know, he's he was a white dude. He's a dead white dude who wrote about women and minorities and, and uh, gay people in a way that was very, very of his time. And, you know, I grew up in this very diverse 
community. Most of my friends are not white. And I wanted to see that represented, that kind of part of LA. So I ended up writing the first of these books as um, kind of a in conversation with Raymond Chandler in a way. But it's really, but I found that I really enjoyed writing crime fiction. I think that it's a really useful tool to explore the ills in a society, especially when you go at it from like the noir hard boiled angle, which is that you kind of take a hard look at what's going on and see like, okay, what is like, what is up with the society? Like what is actually like poisoning the water here? And then like have a murder happen. It can really distill some of the, some of the broader cultural anxieties that, that affect, you know, people who are, who, who commit violence and who are subject to violence. And so I wrote these three books that kind of do that in the genre vein where um, somebody dies and you kind of have to follow along to see why somebody would be pushed to the point where they take somebody else's life. You know, and that's just such a fundamental question to me. You know, what causes people to harm other people? And, you know, that really, it it interests me that you say that and you frame it that way, because I think about the rise of true crime podcasts. You know, that's really seems like a public fixation. And, of course, we've always been interested in, you know, unsolved mysteries and FBI's most wanted. But I, I wonder if there's a connection there between current societal unrest and confusion and uh, desire for things to be made simple and plain. Yeah, you know, and I think, like, when you really look into it, like, the kind of true crime fiction that appeals to me is the stuff that, like, really gets into the the broader issues, you know? I'm less interested in, like, why sicko A does sicko A things than I am in, like, why do, like, people treat each other this way? People who, in other circumstances, might be ordinary you know, law abiding people who are not out to hurt anyone else. You know, what is it about the messaging in our society that makes it okay, for example, for men to hurt women, or for there to be like right wing violence, or, you know, there are just all these kinds of most crime in America, when you look at it, it just doesn't exist in a vacuum. And who hurts who often ends up reflecting some of the prejudices and resentments that are like constantly simmering in our society that like don't usually boil over into violence. But when it does, it's often telling and it's often at those collision points between groups. You know, I find I I find those breaks pretty fascinating. Well, Steph, I want to thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the Modern Law Library. We've been talking about Your House Will Pay by Steph Cha. And if my listeners are interested in reaching out, buying the book, finding out more, I will note it is available on audiobook. Where can they go? How could they do that? It is pretty widely available. I always suggest that people go to their favorite local bookstore, but uh, it's available anywhere that you want to get books. And the audiobook is also widely available. And it's also an ebook and hardcover. And your website is stephcha.com. I want to thank all of my listeners for joining us for this episode of the Modern Law Library. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast listening service.